confirmed my personal trial industry since 1979 and has a wealth of industry knowledge and experience in all aspects of termite management in investigations. Mark is here to share his technical knowledge by highlighting common issues and best practice associated with the termite management industry. Um, also, um, pay close attention to Mark's presentation tonight. Um, there will be a little quiz at the end and there's going to be a $50 bunny to be attached to that. So the first person with the correct answer will win that. So without further ado, I'll pass the microphone to Mark and he'll start tonight's presentation. Thank you very much, Bill. Mark, uh, Master Builders, Queensland, um, to present. But my background, I've uh, been involved in the termite industry, it'll be 40 years in January for me, and uh, I operate a, a consultancy in the termite uh, industry for the QBCC, homeowners, pest controllers, termite barrier manufacturers. There's, there's a pinch myself when I think where I've ended up. Um, my dad was a builder. We used to build about 50 homes a year up the Sunshine Coast. As a kid, I used to lay slabs and footings. Out of that, I got a reasonable idea of how the homes were put together, and I just got no idea how much it helped me in understanding and, and tying the things with termite barriers together later on. I'm a pest controller and fumigator, um, and from the fumigation point of view, building ships, aircraft, silos, um, yeah, goes on. These days, a committee member in the Master Builders Queensland Institute of Building Consultants, a committee member in the Master Builders uh, Queensland Technical Committee, um, committee member, two Australian Standards Committees, BD74 and BD85. BD74 refers to the termite standards, so AS360.0.12 and 3, and then in BD85 is the inspection standards. And on from there, so, and those Australian Standard Committee members' uh, positions now are on behalf of Master Builders in Canberra. Um, I was a speaker in the, um, the Government Permont Working Group back in 2000, ended up producing the building code amendments that you've been working, working to since then, and I'm, I'm quite often get engaged as an expert witness in termite matters. Uh, QCAT, uh, Supreme Court, District Court, yeah, uh, to me it, it doesn't really matter. Um, some of the, the jobs that we've been involved in, some of the projects, uh, the UDQC SRO project at Solutia, uh, where we took physical termite barriers into that. Um, things like the old police barracks in, uh, up on the top of the hill at Petrie Terrace, where we've taken an older existing building and we've needed to know the status of where we were termite-wise in the older building but then they've tied a newer building to it. So we've had to design the termite barriers to join old and new and address the issues within. Uh, Griffith Uni, the old uh, medicine unit down the Gold Coast, was another one. Um, for a long time I was involved with Parliament House um, and uh, with the old Parliament House. And it's an unusual construction in that when we think in termites, we, our termite group base is the foundations and, and we've commonly for many, many years worked with concrete foundations. But when we get back into the, some of the old buildings, then we have um, stone foundations where they have uh, mortar joints between the stone. And the issue with, with that is that the mortar joints aren't termite proof. So you can treat either side of the foundation, but you still can't stop termites coming through the foundation. So it's just some of the issues that you, you come across, but the important part and for me, a lot of what I've found with the pest control industry is that they've not really understood the building side. And I guess I was very fortunate to have come from the building side first. Um, MacArthur Chambers, um, we actually took a termite nest out of the top floor of MacArthur Chambers. And strange enough, it was in the early days of thermal imaging and we were working with a camera that was worth about 120 grand in trying to go through and thermal image the building. And we actually found by detective work something that the thermal camera had missed. Once we got the cameras back, the, ca the images back into the computer, and we started to manipulate the images within the computer, we could actually find, find the termites, but we couldn't find it at the time. It meant that we changed the palette that we worked with with some of the thermal imaging that allowed the termites to become a, a little bit more discoverable. 
And if we went through again, well, we would have discovered this termite nest in a heartbeat. Um, things like the Howsmith wharves underneath the river, again, it's, it's an issue where it's related to construction. We've got essentially a wharf that's actually constructed out of logs. And if you picture logs, termites can attack them in two ways. One is what we call the, the sapwood on the outside, and the other is what they call the pith in the centre. And when I was first involved in this one in 1992, if it weren't for the incompetence of the pest controller that actually went to do the job, we probably would have had one of the biggest fish kills in the history of the Brisbane River. Where the concept was that they, they were going to drill through to the pit, and they used the drill bit at the right length. The problem is that it drilled in at 45 degrees. So it never actually made the pit. So every time it injected a chemical in, okay, it would squirt back at him and say, oh, no termites here, and move on to the next hole. The problem is that if he had actually gotten through to the pit, he would have blown the mud plugs out and probably would have dumped a few hundred litres of hectochlor on the river by the time he woke it up to the fact that, that he'd had a problem. Okay, and in this, in 92, uh, we dealt with this one by arsenic trioxide dust. Sounds dangerous, but it can be used locally and quite successfully. Um, but uh, these days, uh, we're starting to work with things like terminal foam. Some of the things that we go through over the years, and then we look at the building uh, irrigations, and just for a chuckle, that's actually me out sailing down the back of that one. That was Morgan House in George Street, uh, right opposite the casino. Uh, it was the weekend that the exhibition finished. We had, 100, we had four outlets selling alcohol within 100 metres, and um, we're working with a gas that's odorless, colourless, tasteless, and fatal. Yeah, just some of the things we've done. Now we get down to the enemy, and in this case, the issue, and sorry, I'll just go back on one thing here. This is, the drywood termite fumigations are a different thing, and the drywood termites are not to be confused with what we normally call whiteheads. The subterranean termites, which is what you're predominantly concerned about from a construction point of view, they have to work from a, a remote nest, and anything that they can't eat their way through, they have to build a mud tunnel there, which is why we have things like ant tapping and the like, and we do termite barracks, to force the termites into an area where they, they can't be seen. The difference with the drywood termite fumigation is that the termites actually fly to a piece of timber. They work in small colonies. They don't have a contact with an external nest. So the treatment is directed towards the treatment of the timber itself and not the, and not the treatment of the soil or forcing some sort of barrier system at a lower level. So now we get the subterranean termites. And here's a shedder on a termite soldier. But the reality is, he's actually not the enemy. The real enemy is actually the worker. So we go back and we have a look at the soldier. He's got these huge mandibles. And he looks bit, pretty fierce when you look at it from a termite point of view. But his role is actually to protect the worker. And it's actually the worker itself that does the damage. The most important thing I can teach my clients about termites is that you don't need to panic when it comes to subterranean termites. They generally regard it as taking 12 months to do serious economic damage. The most important thing out to take out of that is that you actually have time to make informed decisions. You don't have to make um, decisions instantly. Um, a life lesson is, is simply that, that if someone's trying to panic you into doing something, they're usually not acting in your best interests. Just a life lesson to take out of it. We'll touch a little bit on the obligations of the builder, and, and as I go on from here, I'm, I'm going to steer you towards, um, we'll probably discuss um, brick veneer construction, will probably be the best one to tackle it. We can start to, to tackle other constructions if we deal with questions as we go on, but we'll go through it. So we're, we're working with the NCC, um, but we've also got Queensland building only, um, Queensland only building code amendments, where we took in the definition of the primary building elements, which we did in 2000. Then the other thing is 2006 came the 50 year design line for the termite barracks. And there'll be a reason for this as you get to see as we go on. So how do we get there and how do we get this a flow chart? Again, straight out of the NCC, you guys should all be familiar with this one anyway. But so if you're in a, a high risk area, welcome to mainland Australia, okay, have you got building elements that are subject to termite attack? Basically, you need to do something in relation to the termite management. 
And with the expanded definitions that we got in the 2006 building code amendments, we took in things like architrave, skirtings, uh, window reveals. Um, but that's what we had a change in the definition of the primary building, building elements. The different things that we can do, we can tackle slab edge exposure if we go into brick veneer. If we take the bricks out of the ground, this, the slab edge exposure is one of the cheapest termite barriers that you'll ever get. There are also things that we can do with physical termite barriers like the stainless steel mesh or your chemical sheet products, graded stone like granite guard, uh, there's a graded glass, uh, and then there's the different chemical things. But what we did with the 2001 building code amendments is that if you wanted to work with a chemical um, uh, system, instead of hand spraying like we used to do before, then we brought in reticulation. And the reticulation, you have to have an easy method of replenishment. And typically, if you have to do something and it's done by a drilling and injection technique, well, that's not going to comply um, with those 2001 building code amendments. So, we've been involved in the Australian standards for a while now, from 2006. And in, we managed to get some new standards through, and the first one uh, we finally got through in 2014 was 360.1, which is a termite management for uh, new building work. And it's your relevant Australian standard for new work. The next one we did around the same time was 360.3, and this is where we got into the assessment criteria for the termite management systems. What we did here, the previous things for how that the different termite areas were assessed, you could take up something, and I'm not going to pick on just termite mesh, but termite mesh is a good example, where we know that the termites they have a dimension that they have to squeeze through. So the mesh is designed so that it's a, it's a dimension that the termites can't fit through. And so the original systems on all the CSR assessments um, that let the termite barriers through was done simply on the engineering, really, where could the termites fit through the termite barrier. What we did in 360.3 in 2014 is that instead of assessing just the actual mesh, the physical product, the whole jointing system, the total system overall was considered. And we took in things like expected building movements and the like of what we do. Some termite barrier systems are too brittle. Some have some concerns about their attachments. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit more as we go along too. So if you want to use the concrete slab as part of the termite barrier, and this is probably one of our most common things in in brick veneer construction today is that your slab's got to comply with 2870 or it's got to comply with, the, comply with 3600. Again, that's, you would think that that's a gimmick. I've got one going through at the moment where, where an engineer for a builder has come up with some creative solutions on slab design and it's raising some concerns where it doesn't comply with um, it doesn't comply with 2870 and it doesn't comply with 3600. 2870 makes some allowance for local design, but if you want to use the slab as part of the termite barrier, 3660.1 makes no allowance for alternative designs. We've got some problems here and, and hopefully it can be resolved before it goes through the courts. The issues that we've had with concrete for a while, the old thing about um, wetting up the concrete, those that know me will probably have seen this photo before, but it was a pretty good one. Where you've got the concrete truck driver adding uh, water to the cement, you've got the guy on the pump, well he's actually having a bit of a clean out before it goes through and making sure it's nice and moist too. The problem is that once you upset the water cement ratio, it's very easy to get a 30% reduction in the strength of the concrete. As an industry, the concrete industry has started to, to change this, and now your base mix, where we used to be 80 slump, where you needed a fair bit of back to put into it to work at, now it's done. Your, your base concrete, I believe, is 100 slump now, a bit easier to work with, and you've got half a chance of working it. So this one should go out the window. Concrete compaction, core core 2870, guys that have worked in commercial concrete, well, they work with supervision, they're, they're, they're so up there with, um, with compaction, it's not funny. 
the problem that we've got in domestic slab, and this was taken, this was probably around, yeah, late 90s, early 2000s, and uh, Darren Concreter, because I was still there with the builder, and that is actually the builder in the background, and I'd installed the slab penetrations before, before the pool, and I was hanging around, but he knew that I'd asked for, for the slab to be concreted, that the slab would be compacted. And so, because I'd hung around, he actually had to pull the vibrator down off the truck. And as he started to walk over to it, and with the, with the vibrator, I walked back and I grabbed the camera. And he's called out, what's with the camera bag? I said, oh, maybe I haven't seen one of these come off the truck for a domestic slab in a long time. And uh, never know, I might be able to get you on the front cover of Building Links. Building Links being the VSO's magazine at the time. And he said, don't laugh too hard, buddy. It's still got the same petrol it had in it when I bought it 15 years ago. <laughs> We've come a long way, and compaction is, is an issue if you want to use the concrete slab as part of the termite barrier. I'm not really that stressed about the 100 mm flat work, but I am concerned, concerned about your edge beams, and I'm concerned about your thickening beams, and I'm concerned about what you do around the slab penetrations, particularly where you've got a termite barrier used. Um, where we go. If it's been allowed to slump, in all honesty, the only thing that saved this house is the fact that it's actually uh, got a cypress pine frame. So concrete shrinkage in is, is a bit of an issue to me too. And one of the issues that we have with some of the termite barriers is that there are some on the market that are brittle, where you've got a, a like a hard face. And the problem I've got is if they go over an expansion joint and they're brittle, Shrinkage rates on concrete being typically a millimetre a metre over time. If on a six metre span you're going to take three mil side off it, your termite barrier needs to be flexible enough to deal with that. Now, these brittle things aren't going to survive the testing when it's finally called up through 360.3. Through the testing on point three, there's a few things that are going to fall by the wayside, and you're going to see some details rewritten on the way that some of the termite barriers are attached to your buildings. Termites, we tend to think in terms of dimensions. And the important dimensions to remember are, are that your older chemicals, they're incredibly forgiving from a treat perspective, and they're a hand spray. And they typically, they kill termites up to a metre from where they've been applied uh, for 30 or 35 years. The problem with that is that we're 30 to 35 years and an economic life of the building of 50 years, we know that at some point in the future that we've got to do something again. And unfortunately, we've got a lot of houses that are still out there that are built with the older chemicals where they're now failing. With modern chemical termite barriers, the most important thing we've learned about them is that now it would appear that termites are able to work within 10 millimetres of treated soil. So it's an attention to detail in their application. What was um, issues like excess mortar or render on top of the footing that didn't matter at all with the older style chemicals have, in all honesty, have become critical issues. There really is an attention to detail in the application of newer chemicals. And we now those chemicals have branched again, where we're starting to work with both repellent chemicals and non-repellent chemicals. And the non-repellent chemicals look like they're going to win out in the long term. But I'll touch on that a little bit more. But when we get down to physical termite barriers or chemical sheet products, then we have to remember that termites only need a one millimetre dimension to squeeze through. So if you think of that in the tolerances, and you think in terms of your building with them as your shrinkage in concrete, then that your termite barriers need to be flexible enough to deal with those expected building movements. These are the dimensions that we need to remember. So if we look at the termite entry points in a typical brick veneer, number one, 90% of cases in termite entry and brick veneer is the external perimeter between the finished um, uh, soil or slab height and the top of the footings. We started to think about a few others. Number two being a slab footing joint failure, three being a crack in the concrete slab itself, four up beside the slab penetrations, and finally, um, uh, fit number five being a potential uh, foundation failure. But termites, if you look in terms of the failing of the concrete slab, if you think that termites need a one millimetre dimension to squeeze through, 
then that's got to be a one millimetre dimension all the way through the concrete slab. In practical terms, we usually find that it comes back down to how the concrete's been chaired. All slabs will crack. If the concrete's been uh, chaired correctly and your, um, your mesh is sitting high in the slab, then you'll get smaller curing cracks in the top and your larger cracks will appear in the bottom of the slab. If, the, if it hasn't been changed correctly and the reinforcing has been able to sit lower in the slab, then we're starting to see some larger cracks in the top of the slab. That's, that's not rocket science. The issue is that if, if it gets to the point where termites are needing a millimetre all the way through the slab, then there's usually got to be some foundation movement which we'll find in some cracking in the brickwork. And I'm not really that stressed about cracking where it's, it's typically to the, to the mortar joints. Where I do get concerned is if it gets to the point that we've got brick shear. And once we've got a brick shear, then we start to have to raise some questions. Um, again, going back to the way that the old chemicals used to work, and if you look at where they're applied, they're typically applied just on the surface, and, but they have this vapor action in the soil with chlorine in their, in the, in their, in their makeup then they, they kill termites up to a metre from where they've been applied, but they're not coming back. If they only last 30 to 35 years, then the economic life of the building is 50 years. We talked about where we had to go before, but we've also got the health and safety issues to consider. They were misused, and that was the first thing, but once they finally got through to people, they stored the body fats for 15 years plus, and they also had an ability to pass through the food chain. A cow could eat, you could spray a bit of grass, cow could eat the grass, we would eat the meat, we would drink the milk, the chemical shows in us. Um, joys of being at the top of the food chain. When we get into the newer style chemicals, and again we look at, look at where they're applied, either hand spray or a drill and inject underneath, or what we're trying to do is form that area to stop them coming up between the external perimeter. Um, again, it has to be formed continuously, and things like Alpercet, Biflex, Clopyrifos Paris. I'm going to single out a couple as we go on here that turned out, and the label expected protection periods. Alpercet, up to seven years now. Biflex, up to at least 10 years. Clopyrifos, five and 10 years. Five years as a soil perimeter, 10 years under slab. Uh, premise, up to five years. And Termidor, at least eight years. And these are all based on South Petronic Capricorn. Once we get up in North Queensland, we start to deal with mastotermias as a species of termites. And mastotermias can still be controlled, but typically, um, where we're talking in terms of a dilution rate, probably twice as strong, um, and for an expected protection period, about half as, half as long as what we've achieved south of Tropic Capricorn. They can still be controlled. Of all the modern tomatocytes, I'll go out on a limb here and, and I'll, I'll go with Termidor as probably being the chemical that's probably producing the better results. And, and again, this is on practical experience, not on, um, and no, I'm not paid by Termidor, I'm independent as independent can ever get. Um, this property, to me, is stable. It's largely unaffected by moisture. It's non-repellent to termites and it's aggressive towards the termite nest. Just something to bear in mind. But in some of the more sensitive applications, there is a, a place for ultraset. It's not quite as stable in the soil, um, but it, it's pretty much insect, insect specific in that there's no personal protection requirements for either the pest control technician applying it or for the occupants of where it's being applied. So there are times that it has a role. Still a bit of a concern fish-wise if you get near water courses, but for the most part, um, it's from a safety point and you need to get into a sensitive area, it's something to remember as part of the toolkit. But if they're used in a pre-construction situation, they all need to have um, a reticulation system to comply with the 50 year design requirement. And there are some reticulation systems that are better than others. And there's one system on the market where it's actually got a, um, a, a working pressure of 14 psi. The most common pump pressure that's used by the best control is 100 psi. If you hook 100 psi up to a 14 psi system, you blow up the beds underground where you can't see it. And with all these reticulation systems, and, I, and I, I can't say that I'm a huge fan, because there's no verification that you're actually getting distribution. 
you're hoping on a wing and a prayer that the system better not make the concrete slab is actually going to work. And just remember that if we work with a modern chemical, termites can work within 10 millimetres of treated soil. One block nozzle, and you've got a potential failing in your system. Again, one of the concerns that I've got as we go. There is a very good system on the market that if I look at it from an engineering perspective, it's actually been quite well designed. This one actually works with pressure pipe. It'll take pressure pipe and pressure glue. will take 100 PSI all day long. The other thing that they do with it is they actually, the areas, the pipes that are drilled to allow the distribution of the chemical are wrapped in a geotextile fabric that'll actually let the chemical through but it'll prevent the soil coming back and blocking the nozzles. Okay, one of the things that to me, if you had to do something from a reticulation point of view, here's something that you could. Again, I'm not paid by anybody in this and I'm as independent as. Then we get into the physical and chemical sheet termite barriers. <coughs> they range from trichor, home guard, cordon, plasmite, termites, there's a range of them. But they have different properties. And then we tick them. Then we get into things like your, um, your graded materials, be they granite or glass, and then they use a plastic strip shielding. Again, the 50 year design line, and where we've gone, so instead of the chemical thing where we had a maximum with the older style, 30, 35 years, these all, these modern chemical sheet products installed properly, along with a slab laid properly in accordance with the standards, we're actually talking 50 year design lines. We're talking like the building here. Okay, to me, I think this is the way that we're, we've headed in the right direction, where we're designing things to work for the life of the building. So there's this, this room here. Annual timber pest inspections are still appropriate and required. Again, we go back and how we got to the annual inspection things. We think in terms of if termites do take 12 months to do serious economic damage, then an annual inspection, regardless of framing, regardless of the treatment that's been used, things can bar anything that's installed by humans, there's a failure rate, okay? But at least at the annual timber pest inspections are a balance between inspecting too often for someone's hit pocket versus inspecting not often enough um, that they're left looking at structural damage. So we're going to touch a little bit on here on some of the things where we get to on the dispute side. We can use a multitude of different termite protection systems, but the builder takes the overall responsibility and there's no effective time limit on the builder's exposure for that responsibility. If negligence can be proved on the part of the builder, it doesn't matter if it's 20 years down the track and it's the 20th homeowner, there's an action still available against the builder. As builders, you should think about this in every job that you do. Okay, I like the concept of termite resistant framing. Now that to me can be natural resistant timbers and the Australian standards contain a range of those, but essentially if you think in terms of a decent hardwood, um, uh, cypress pine, treated pine, or steel. And I don't really care which one it is, but what that does, it limits the consequences of termites attacking to a home. And if there's an issue, if there's an issue in relation to uh, termites that looks like coming back to you as a builder, if you've recommended termite resistant framing to your clients and your clients uh, follow your recommendation, they're actually paying you to limit your liability. As a builder, to me, this has to be a win-win. I, I, I can't understand why, why we're still building in just ordinary point. There are a lot out there. But to me, I think it's worthwhile thinking in terms of um, termite resistant framing. But there are some limitations to the termite resistant framing. This is a job I spoke about earlier where I've got a problem with a, um, a slab where an engineer's come up with an unusual design. And we've got a treated pine frame, but the cut ends, we've got a failing within the slab, and it's either a construction joint concealed underneath a floor covering or we've got something failing around the slab penetrations. On top of that, we've got the waterproofing leaking um, on the main shower. 
and it's flooding in behind. The termites have been opportunistic, followed the moisture through and come up and they've gotten on, on, onto a cut end of a, a treated pine frame and then they've been able to run through, through the frame. The treated frame is still going to do its job in that they might get onto one cut end and they might get onto one stick but then they get up to the next stick and they're on to, a, to a, an area that's not been cut and that's usually enough to get them and force them out in the open where they're going to be found in some of the more resilient timbers and I'll touch on this a little bit later but I do like the concept of running termite resistant, termite susceptible architraves and skirtings and you, you'll see why as we go on. We spoke about limiting the liability. I love the concept where they can pay you to limit your liability. I also like the idea of termite resistant window reveal store jams. And the reason for that is that they're the timbers that are more difficult for a <coughs> place of better termites were to occur. And I do like the concept of the termites and set of market trades and skirtings. And it's like leaving an inbuilt early warning system for the termites. So, the termite protection certificates we touched on handover a little bit here. We can move through this one pretty quick. Typical handover will be your, your termite barrier installation certificates, your warranty documents, and recently they brought this back to a single durable notice. My understanding is that the pest control industry, the most of them will still continue to install uh, dual notices. The things, the discussions that we've had at the standard level, um, the industry wanted to keep going with dual notices because they see it as a way of probably getting the termite issue across to the homeowner a little bit better by having dual notices, but recently it's come back to one. We spoke before about a builder's liability. If you, you start doing a renovation on something, a simple test is that if you're building over or installing a hard cover over, over an area, over a termite protected area, you own what's under it. You either have to make provision that, that your people can re easily replenish the existing system that was underneath, or you have to you have to update what's underneath you. But the simple rule is that if you build over it, you own it. And we've touched on the builder's obligations before, and we and again I come back to the negligence issue, and that if negligence can be proven on the part of the builder then it doesn't matter if it's the 20th homeowner, 20 years down the track, if you're still trading, an action is still available against you. Some more work as an expert witness um, in the field, and there's an interesting definition, and this is one in the Federal Rule, rule of Evidence. Um, and some would prefer the original one, which was X being an unknown quantity, sperm being a drip under pressure, and you can take it whichever way you want. But the duty of an expert witness is to assist the court, regardless of who is paying their bills. Now, we've got a fair bit of grey hair around the room here at the moment, and don't, don't be afraid, if you have the technical expertise, don't be afraid of being looking at the expert witness thing as you, you go on. It's something Obviously, to get there, you need the technical expertise to get there, and and with the, with with experience, you, you most likely have that. But there are three other things that you probably need to bring to an expert witness field if you want to have credibility in the court. They being independence, honesty, and fairness. Okay, and they're three keys. Your duty is to assist the court. It's doesn't matter who's engaged you. Builder, homeowner, pest controller, it doesn't matter who's engaged you. Once you're engaged as an expert witness, responsibility is to the court. You have to assist the court. And so you provide the best advice you can to solve the problem. It might ne necessarily be solving the client's problem. Sometimes you can end up with a client that probably doesn't agree with the way that you've handled it. But the reality is you have to solve the problem and you have to help the court to do that. Okay. Now, we, what constitutes a termite dispute? A really simple test in relation to the integrity of a termite protection system is, can termites gain a hidden access to the building? And we'll touch on a couple of issues here as we go. 
The next thing to me when I look at a dispute is, is there anything that the homeowners have done to assist a hidden termite access to the home? If they haven't, and the termites have been able to gain that hidden access to the home, then it's actually going to come back to the builder, and there are very few that don't. Sometimes it can be a builder's sub trade, and it's not uncommon for me to get engaged by a homeowner, and then end up getting engaged by a builder in a separate action against his supplier, his termite marrow installer, or whatever. All I'm interested in, and again I go back to where we were with the role of an expert witness, the duty is actually to assist the court. We want to solve the problem, and we want to find a way through this. And I've got one barrister I actually went to boarding school with, and he turned around and he said, Mark, he said, I can't afford to engage you on a job. I said, this will be good, Russell, where's this coming from? He said, everything that you, we, you, we engage you in, it settles. We don't make any money out of it. I said, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. Okay? The issue is to solve it. But there are exposures for you as a builder if termites can gain and get access to the building. And the idea is to get it. So the next question is, have the annual inspections been carried out? It's not the end of the world. To me, we have to make an assessment of whether the damage is consistent with what could have occurred within 12 months. If I can reach a conclusion that the damage is consistent with more than 12 months, then the builder's exposure can be lessened, but it will never be alleviated. At the end of the day, there was a fault that's allowed the termites coming through, and the builder will have an exposure. But if, it, if the termite uh, inspections haven't been carried out, and the damage that's been found isn't, is consistent with less than 12 months, whether the inspections were carried out or not, then has no bearing whatsoever. We come back to the original thing is, was there a negligence in the termite barriers not being formed properly, which would then get attributed to the builder? Then it's up for the builder to determine whether there's an action available back against the, the termite barrier installer, for instance, or whether it comes back to whether the slab's been laid properly, a crunching slab, whatever it might be. But the inspections aren't the be all and end all. Again, getting into some of the disputes, to me, the termite barrier where an external slab height compromised the weed pole. And there's a screwdriver sitting in the top of the weed pole, and we've got a physical termite barrier laid down at the bottom, bottom of the weed pole. And termites can easily gain a hidden access to the home. Slab laid by the builder, um, the external slab laid by the builder, as well as uh, the main home. That's, a claim against the builder, it's a defect and actions require. There's, there's no choice. There's no other way that you can explain it. <coughs> where we start to get into this, where we get into a reduced inspection zone, and we touch on things with the standard tolerances manual, where we look for 75 mil uh, underneath the termite barrier. I'm not overly stressed about the 75 mil, and I go back to the original test that I spoke about before, and that is, can termites gain a hidden access to the building? If I look at it and the termite barrier itself isn't actually compromised and you can re relatively still inspect it, to me it doesn't matter. There are some termite barrier installation manuals that allow inspection zones as low as 20 mil in some scenarios. So to me, if the termites can't get a hidden access to the building, it's a technical defect, but there's no action actually required. Termites still can't gain a hidden access to the building. Simple <coughs> test. That would be a personal opinion. And, but again, it's something that on behalf of my clients that will get fronted at some point in, in QCAT or Supreme Court somewhere. If we talk in terms of the physical termite barriers, we spoke before about the braided materials and they use a plastic strip shielding at the weep hole level and it's curved back into the, the cavity and the cavity gets filled. Some of the things that we've found, it's important to note that with a system <coughs> like this, is that the termites, they don't actually have to show themselves out in the 75 mil inspection zone. They can actually run up underneath the termite barrier, then up through the cores of the bricks, and they can actually travel just directly below that L-shaped strip shielding or your chemical sheet product, or your turning mesh. They don't actually have to show, they only have to show themselves in this last section. They don't have to show themselves in inspection, in that inspection zone. 
they can still hide it behind. And so that comes back to where it was, about the 75 mil. It's not the be all and end all. Can turbines gain a hidden access is a simple test that, that I rely on. And all the Australian standard compliant turbine barrier systems are designed to prevent a hidden turbine <coughs> access to the homes. That's the test. Some of the issues, million dollar bill, you live the perfect storm. A turbine barrack not installed uh, correctly. There's a hole there in the turbine barrier. It's not been overlapped property, properly. This took us four years to find, by the way, so we're starting to talk some dollars here. The only thing that saved the, the builder in this case, I think, was the fact that the, the builder and the homeowner were actually quite good friends. And they managed to maintain the friendship through this, through communication. Another story. Seagull construction boxing on the garage slab. That hole just happened to come inside with a water joint hidden around a T junction in the block wall. Okay, we treat by the side of it, which <coughs> wants to go away for a while. Then they come back. This went on for a long time. And when we opened, when we finally got to the point, we knew that we'd, we'd just got to take blocks out and find out what's actually happening here. So we, we started to take blocks out, and this is what we found. But the other thing that we found, this is a chemical sheet product, and if you have a look at this hole here, and that piece of mud, that piece of mud came off that, I reckon that I reckon the termites actually managed to penetrate the termite barrier. Yeah, but that's why I've got the term is in here. So the things you find. Another one, there's a bitumen based termite protection product on the market. It's changed again in recent times, and I think part of it is because of this. But this one was where it was installed uh, too too thin by the termite barrier installed, <coughs> is what was claimed. And copper termites were actually able to get through it. And again, it had been installed over a slab construction joint. And then a timber floor, very, very expensive timber floor laid out the top of it. This was a million dollar bill here. Okay, and again, uh, they managed to get through it. Repaired by the termite barrier manufacturer because the installer refused to stay involved in it. Strange. Um, let the hung the bill around to dry. Okay, that's another thing. Uh, the insurer ended up settling that one. This one is a defect to me where you've got a termite barrier level at this level, <coughs> and then it's actually the termite barrier level has actually been compromised by the vertical tiles that have been laid over the face of the doorway. Okay, the termites can actually hide behind uh, the glue and behind the tile. And so again, we come back to our simple test. Termites can, can now gain a hidden access to the building. A chemical reticulation system. Now, someone's commented that, that there's a defect in the overhang and the brickwork. My interest was that when we look at installing a chemical termite barrier, the standard calls for us to install a barrier 150 mil wide to 50 mil below the top of the footings. Now, if we're going to do that, if it's going to be 150 wide from uh, the brick line or, or from the up against the slab, then really that line should be 75 mil from the slab or brick line. Okay, now if it's outside it, to me, that's a defect. You're actually treating an error outside. And what guarantee have we got that, that, that it's actually going to cover that area that we're after, the 150 mil wide? It, it, it's outside where it should be. And these things that you don't find until so you lift the concrete slab. Um, we an unusual one, where this one's term mesh. I'm not picking on term mesh here, and it's just an interesting job that we came across one day. Term mesh in their original CSIRO appraisal, where they used it as an end cap on top of an engaged pier, they require a fibro slip joint on top of the turn mesh to separate the bearer and, and the turn mesh. So that if you need to move the turn mesh in over the top of it, okay, then you're not going to shoot the mesh. Turn mesh is a woven stainless steel mesh. I'll lose the mic for a second and we'll see how we go. We doing okay? Okay, turn mesh being a woven stainless steel mesh, the problem that you've got on it is that if you actually put something heavy on top of, of it and then you, you move that heavy thing on top, 
it actually moves the fibres in the mesh because it's a woven mesh and not a, not a welded mesh. And it changes the dimensions and it won't continue to achieve its, its uh, termite proof dimensions. And if you have a look at the hammer marks in the bearer, okay, then you start to think, well, okay, got a little bit of a concern about what we've got under here because we have no fibrous slip joint. Not to say defect, can't go anywhere. This one was interesting that they used um, a termite barrier on the outside where it joined onto the concrete slab, but they never actually used it out here. And the concern isn't so much that, because there's a termite barrier and a brick course where they brought a pier on. The, the issue was actually the way that the termite barrier was jointed onto the concrete slab. Okay, that failed, and again left the builder exposed. This was a, a job where there was a multi, multitude of systems, and what they've used is they've used a graded stone and they've used an FMC home guard um, over the top in to cover two different sections. The problem was that the cavity for the for the graded stone wasn't uh, clean well enough before they put the stone in, and it really didn't improve, achieve the dimensions that it should have done, and it's, and allowed the termites to come back through. <coughs> Again, once it was once it was revealed, prepared by the builder, and the termite bear installer worked together, um, a good one. This one was one where again the house had been built for a little while, and we've got a concrete slab. Carpet comes along. Termite bear has been installed. Carpet goes goes to install the bottom plates near a doorway, and the termite bear to him is in the way, so he lifts it. Installs his bottom plate and then allowed, and then folds the termite bearer over the top of the bottom plate again. Okay, so the, the termite bearer has no attachment to the slab. Again, this is one of these things that you only find when you start doing the autopsies and you start removing the bricks. <laughs> We've always got to throw up on it both. And there must have been a bit of spring in the floor. It's solved. Not so much from a termite perspective, but yeah. There's an effect for them. Some of the issues in some of the things that we've come across, we in terms of um, the chemical sheet products, and there are chemical sheet products that are continuous all the way, all the way through the product, and the, those that, that I would call a laminated termite barrier, where you've got your uh, chemical in a, <coughs> in a fabric matrix in the centre, and you've got two clean plastic sheets over the top. There's nothing to stop the termites going through the, the clean plastic sheets on the outside. And if the termite barrier gets to delaminate, then, then it's a bit of an issue to me. When you go back to where we were with that one where they've actually come through the termite barrier, but if they've got no chemical <coughs> matrix to work, work on at all, then it's an issue. I don't have an issue with these products where they're used, where they're installed underneath the bottom plate and you get compression. I don't have an issue where they're in the brick line and they get compressed. Okay, termites aren't going to get through. Where I do get an issue, where I do have an issue is where they're installed underneath the doorway, okay, and or underneath the um, a window, a low window reveal, for instance, where you're not getting compression. Okay, it's an issue to me in that if they only glue one side and it gets to delaminate, okay, for any reason, then termites can actually go through that clean sheet. Something to be watched for, and, and I think you'll see with the testing under 360.1.3 and testing the whole system, you're going to come up with some new attachment systems for these uh, laminated termite barriers, <coughs> and they'll start to show. And I can see a double fold. This termite barrier being a chemical sheet product claims repellency, and there's what those building over the top of a cut in, and I question the repellency. Okay, I, I've got concerns about repellency, and I've still got concerns about this one when you think about that I've got that hole with that piece of mud that we looked at before from that million dollar bill. I am really concerned about where they're trying to claim repellency. It, 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 I, I don't believe that you can legitimately claim it. And that same termite barrier has a detail that allows it to be actually set setback five mil back in behind the render. Okay. If you're going to work with a chemical sheet product or a physical termite barrier, 
you want to see it in the strike line. Okay, you want to be able to see it. If you I don't rely on these details, but they go back to me on. And if you've got a termite barrier installer that's not leaving them visible in the strike line, ask the question, guys. Okay, because there's a danger. My, my concern with render is that render has the potential to delaminate, and then termites can actually work up in behind the render. And if they can get past that in a gap between where it's not visible in the strike line, then it's an issue. This is where a product where I like it, where it's actually all the way through the termite barrier. And you can glue it to the termite barrier with a, with a termite resistant uh, sealant or silicon, and that's fine. It doesn't matter. They're not going to get through that product because it's all the way through the product. Delamination is not an issue here. This one was a graded glass job. And graded glass, the one note that I'll make on this, they actually came through it up in the corner here. And it seemed to go the depth, once we did the autopsy on this one and, and took the bricks out to get to here, it looked like it was installed with the dimensions, but the one point that I'll make on it, when I compare it to a graded stone and I looked at the graded glass, the weight wasn't there. In the Australian standards, we actually call up a specific size, weight and shape for the, um, for the graded material. And I've got a sneaking suspicion this one didn't meet the weight issue. It was going to make it, again, a trap to watch if you get something that comes unstuck and you get um, a termite infestation hidden. hidden. It's one of the issues that um, we might have to touch on later on. Stainless steel mesh and it's corroded. It was an issue when the manufacturer went offshore with the, um, with the, uh, the manufacturer of the mesh rather than manufacturing in Australia and it, it showed up the wall. The one thing I can say, well, one of the, one of the uh, homes that was affected was one of the master builders' membership officers' own homes. That one got fixed pretty quickly for some reason or other. I don't know how that happened. But I will say that Term Mesh have had an incredible product stewardship in that there's even been jobs that I've been, I've found corroded mesh at a pre-purchase level and they've actually repaired it and we've actually been able to get a commitment before the contract went unconditional that they were going to repair it and they did and the client proceeded with the purchase. Okay, so it's just an issue to watch for. Just one of the things I've come across in my travels. Uh, this one was a, an aluminium termite barrier where they used a conventional silicon rather than a, a, a termite proof silicon to join it to the uh, concrete slab. Again, this is strip shielding on graded stone barrier. And we spoke before about the termites being able to work to just the underside and not having to show themselves in the inspection zone. And what copter species termites have done is that actually chewed a, a gap, they'd actually been able to gouge out the strip shielding. Repaired by the manufacturer, repairs to the home by the termite barrier manufacturer and assessed as a product as a product claim. They put this one down to a faulty batch of strip shielding. Now they're supposed to achieve an 80 shore D hardness in order to be regarded as a termite barrier. Seems to be the figure that everyone goes to. This one may not have made that. There's a termite barrier that's come onto the market that I'm seeing, and this one is impregnated all the way through the sheet. But I'm seeing that it's not actually, it seems to be quite flimsy, and I think it'd be flat up like a 50 UM in thickness. And a, a little bit of a concern, it's one I'll, I'll watch the space. I actually got this photo up in Toowoomba, on a building site in Toowoomba. Um, it would be interesting to see where we go. I'll be watching the space with a bit of interest, and I'm concerned about the possible damage from your trainees, your brickies and the like coming through after, where this could be damaged after installation. Um, a termite barrier installation, again, an aluminium style strip shielding. Uh, that goes through and then it's bonded where it's concrete nail on the side of the concrete slab and it wasn't enough silicon was really the issue here. This termite, but it, it was a top, proper termite proof silicon but not, not enough to actually fill and prevent and the, the silicon shrunk and peeled back away and left a gap for the termites to come through. 
again, the things you find through autopsy. And that's a pretty good slab penetration with the termite protection doing its job out in the cavity for the termites with plenty of room to get around. Same job, that's how they dealt with the electricals. Okay. I've got a little bit of concern about the slab, but I've also got the termite graves. Now, I actually reported that. I rang the builder about it and raised my concerns. Bricks still went up on Monday. Okay. And it's not far from home. It's, I know it's going to cross the desk at some point. We talk in terms of dimensions where you've got things in, in uh, timber posts and stirrups. This one's clearer, and being a hardwood, I'm not overly stressed. The difference being with a hardwood is that instead of being able to go all the way through like the, the timber, like they can with a piece of pine, this one, well, they've got to come in and out, okay, and it's not too bad. But typically, given an opportunity, uh, then try and, and leave yourself 75 mil between the timber and the ground. Uh, is where I'd prefer to head. The end capping, where they actually forgot it. Okay, and I don't know, I don't have a bit of an issue with the pine back end, but that's another story. And the tie down rod, we touch on that a little bit more. We've spoke before about render and render delaminating. One of the issues that I've got is that the render can delaminate. And so, if that's the case, again, it comes back down to if you're going to use a render, and even if you're using the corner edgings uh, for the render, that's fine. But make sure your termite barrier is visible all the way through at, at the point that you're going to use for your termite barrier. Bring it to the outside where you can see it. Now, if you want to use an exposed slab edge, don't render it if you've got a choice. Okay, I'm quite comfortable with a painted um, exposed slab edge and the beauty with paint is that it's still flexible enough that if termites run behind the paint it's actually still going to bulge the paint and again the termites are going to be visible. With a render that it's not going to do that, it'll certainly delaminate the termites can hide behind it. And if you've got an exposed slab edge that doesn't meet what you could call an aesthetic or tradesman-like finish, think in terms of some of the high bond renders that are the high bond materials that you can use and that you've got half a chance of actually getting back to a finish. An ordinary render won't do it, but some of these high bond systems stand a chance for achieving it. Um, yeah, nothing like bring the tie down through, and that's, there's another use of sand cap. We spoke before some of the render, and if you see render like this on top of uh, an area treated with a modern chemical thermite barrier, well, and this one where, where people have been doing repeated treatments for years and never seen to stop the termites. Nobody had ever bothered to take the render off the top of it with uh, a modern chemical barrier. So every time that they, they'd spray over the top of it, the termites were actually still working the joint between the render and the pudding. Okay, they never actually stopped the termites. Some of the issues. Um, plumbing, water across the top of the footings. With the plumbing wrapped in able flex as it grows, goes across the footings. Physical termite barrier to the slab penetrations and a chemical pruner. But there's a slab wooden joint finally, finally sitting there. Okay, the builder was building 600 homes a year at the time. He went white. Yeah, but there, there you go. Again, um, yeah, plumbing brought through the, uh, the footing but too close to the top of the footing and it's actually cracked on top. Slab footing joint failure. Okay, again, slab, physical protection of the slab, um, slab penetration and a chemical uh, perimeter. Slab footing joint failure and there was a claim. Concrete ran out of concrete while he's pouring the footing. What saved this is that there's a physical termite barrier at the top. The one thing that the modern chemicals have a great deal of difficulty in dealing with is a failing foundation. In a worst case scenario, we'll treat either side of the foundation, okay? But the one thing that we're not doing is addressing um, where the concrete will actually shrink back away, where there's a joint in that foundation. And we can't deal with it with modern chemicals. All we can do is strip the bricks and address the joint, the slab, and the footing, and go through. This wouldn't have been found until there was an autopsy, but what saved this one was a physical termite barrier over the top, which <coughs> can actually fail from a termite perspective, but they're still actually caught in the physical termite barrier above it. 
waffle pot, but there's some of the foam poking through the concrete slab. Um, yeah, and the old tree root, where the termite barrow installed has laid a termite barrow over the top of the tree root. Just a side note to up. Yeah, but I don't know, some of it make it easy to pick up uh, the things that we go about. Now, there's an issue that I, that I, that's crossed my desk in recent times, and that's cone mark. And I'm starting to lose a bit of faith here. Again, we're getting to a personal opinion. It's something that as a builder that you're going to actually have to have a look out for. Someone, at an Australian standard level, when we design a termite barrier, they're designed to be prophylactic. It's probably the best way to describe it. There is a complete barrier that termites can't get through to get into a building. A termite baiting system relies on a bait being placed every three metres around the house. And on a wing and a prayer, they hope that the termites find the bait before they get into the house. And at a standard level, you're never going to see um, you're never going to see a termite baiting system accredited through an Australian standard level while this backside points at the ground. <coughs> but some under code mark, one of one of the companies was able to go to a code mark appraiser and get them to sign off on on a termite baiting system as a standalone termite protection system. This one got presented to me in a dispute where the builder, again, a pretty substantial uh, waterfront, uh, probably a Tenerife, and they've done a, um, builders actually laid a new slab, um, but not installed the conventional termite barrier when he's laid the slab, he's forgotten to. Then there are tiles compromising the exposed slab edge. Uh, he's got some bricks, he's got some block work, and, but he's forgotten to install the termite barrier. So, as we're negotiating where we get to, he comes up and he, with the idea of using his code mark appraised termite barrier okay, to get this one over the line that he didn't need to install the termite barrier. And I've and I just looked at it and I've gone, well, if you want to get this one up, the difference is that had you installed the ter a correct termite barrier, physical or chemical sheet product, there would have been no ongoing maintenance costs other than the annual inspections. Okay, whereas if you, I've seen these termite baiting systems as high as $6,900 on a normal domestic home and maintenance costs as high as $1,500 a year. And my question was to the builder, are you prepared to cover the owner's ongoing costs now that they're about to face that they wouldn't have had to face before? He said, I'll pull the slab, thank you very much. Okay, it is where we got to. But it's something to be aware of. If, if someone comes to you as a builder and comes up with a system where they want to <coughs> want to install a termite baiting system rather than probably more conventional termite barriers, ask the question, guys. What are the maintenance costs? What are you committing your homeowners to? Okay, there's how this one got through. This nearly brought code mark down. Um, it, it got so, so close. It, it's been through Must Builders Queensland. Um, Master Builders Queensland, 7 o'clock one morning. I got it at 7 o'clock. I had it with Master Builders in Queensland by 9 o'clock. By 11 o'clock it was uh, with Master Builders in Canberra. And by midday it was with the ABCB. It, this one came so close to pulling code mark down. So what do you need to do? Well, it's pretty simple, really. Okay, Lay your slabs in accordance with the standards. It's pretty simple and install termite barriers in accordance with the Australian standards. There are no shortcuts. I wish there was a magic wand. I haven't found one yet. Okay, there is no magic wand. Okay, there are no shortcuts. The difference between doing something right and wrong is usually not much more than a bit of thought and attention to detail. And if there's a cost associated with doing something properly, all you've got to do is explain it to your clients properly and they'll be falling over themselves to pay you to do it properly. The ultimate solution. Head down a right road and you'll end up being so busy with work being referred to you that you'll never be able to work again for the rest of your life. Head down the other road, then there's a very good chance that we'll meet again. Only thing is it could be in the building tribunal, and there's a very good chance we'll be sitting on opposite sides of the desk. Okay. The purpose of tonight's presentation is to show you way, a way through the termite issue so that you don't end up before the courts. 
I've got an unusual business plan. I don't mind getting involved in the education side of what we do. I've lectured in a certificate for a building in Ronga Tafe, been involved in things like the standards of the building codes. My business plan is pretty simple. If everything that we've gone for actually gets through and it actually solves the problem, I'm out of work. That's a really, really unusual business plan for this modern world. But I have a sneaking suspicion that I'm never going to be out of work again for the rest of my life. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much for having me.